Dr. Brenda Fry. As we get into this talk, I did want to echo um, Dr. Graney's idea that he, um, he posited earlier t today about the, f the fact that when he was able to view the last solar eclipse and was able to see the solar corona, that that particular view is not something that people have been, you know, evolved to appreciate or something like that. Almost no one's ever seen this corona with their own eyes. So it's very special in that sense, and the fact that that really, you know, really mo moved him was what was special, right? So um, what I'm going to show you today are also views of the universe that we don't normally see. They're not just pictures of a couple of stars at night, which I still love to see when I looked through these telescopes last night, but they're actually, you know, the views that are taken through um, the world's best telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. Some of the results I'll show are actually, um, you know, they're, they're real, the real results, they're the latest results that we have. In fact, I gave a couple of talks recently with all PhDs in the room and all of the results were embargoed still at that point and I would not reveal a single piece to them because we all had to, you know, announce the results at the same time. We had to protect the careers of students and so on who we were having to lead this. So this, this is kind of special, hopefully. I hope you'll enjoy it. And then finally, one conference goer came up to me and said, so, you know, I read these articles in the newspaper as well about the James Webb Space Telescope, and where do they come from? Like, how do they go from your result to that place? And I said, well, 95% of the time, we get a result, and if it's really a big one, we'll make a press release, which just gives kind of the facts, and then different press organizations will contact us at that point and say, oh, we want to build this into an article for New York Times or whatever it is. But in, in this case, it's the first time in my whole career that some of the early results started to come out, and I started to see articles in popular places without anyone contacting me, you know? So I think that maybe they thought the public would like these results, and so I hope you do too. So let's get started. So this, these are updates from the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll try to recount it from you know, the very first day to the present. I study galaxy clusters. So the first topic is what is a galaxy cluster, okay? So, um, and the second one is to introduce the JWST PEARLS program. That's the name of the program that I helped to develop in which we observe galaxy clusters with the James Webb Space Telescope. And then the third topic, I'm gonna let you know what, you know, what went on during opening night, meaning during the very first day, which is actually night, when we've got the first data in from the James Webb Space Telescope that we were able to look at. And there are a whole lot of other stories to tell. I had to pick and choose, I can say. But the last topic then will be uh, the big discovery um, that we made uh, right about this time last year. If anyone has questions as I go, please interrupt. I don't want to you know, leave anyone behind or something. So do raise your hand high or just speak out. Yes. Where is it floating? Oh, right, 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 right. That was something that Father Sopi also recommended I might mention. Yeah. So the James Webb Space Telescope is in space, purely a space-based telescope. And it is far away, you know, greater than the distance of the moon in a place called the Lagrangian Two Point. Okay. So it was... A, a big, big risk, you know, we had to put, you know, all the eggs in one basket, do they say, right, you know, and, and build this $10 billion instrument, put it more than a million miles away into space. It's so far away it orbits the sun directly, and it's a one-time, one-shot, either get it right or it's a $10 billion piece of junk. It's a big deal. Yes? So you said you were going to show us some things, but isn't the James Webb telescope not the visual light spectrum. Right. Well, it is partly. It goes down to 6,000 angstroms, actually, which is, you know, roughly orange, orange red. And it works primarily in the near infrared. That's right. 
But those are still colors. They're just colors that go you know, beyond the range that we can see. So if you look at the Roy G. Biv of the rainbow, they just go beyond the red into the infrared. Those are, we still consider those to be colors, and we can assign you know, false colors to them so that we can see them with our eyes. If that makes a little sense. <laughs> we, we can't show them only in the near infrared or it'd look like that black screen right before we started. <laughs> yeah, okay, but, <laughs> but that's the best we've got. Yeah, that's all we can do. Yeah. No, it's not beyond Mars. No, it's not, not beyond Mars. No, it's not beyond Mars. It's, it's in a relatively stable gravitational point called Lagrangian 2 where it's not being, you know, it's relatively stable. It's in a gravitational stability point where it's not being pulled towards the sun, pulled towards, you know, the Earth pulled towards the moon. It's in a stable okay, place there. Past the moon. Yeah, past the moon is not, not to Jupiter. Not I mean, not, not to Jupiter or Mars, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Past the moon. Yes, yeah. Okay, I can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, for those of you who didn't know, we live in a really big universe. It's so mind-bogglingly big, right? You'd think that a trip to the chemist is a far distance, but <laughs> I'm sure you all know where this comes from. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah. Hitchhiker's Guide. Okay. Right. Mind-bogglingly big place. Maybe we'll just start like that. Okay. And the, I suppose the most important little tidbit to add is that our universe is expanding away from us in all directions. I think we all know that by now, right? The universe, it uh, turns out that every single object that we can see that's very far away from our own galaxy, the Milky Way, every one is moving away from us in every direction that we look. Not only that, but the farther away we look, the more distant objects, the faster those objects appear to be moving away from us. Moving away from us. Well, the, 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 the planets aren't really included. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, um, you know, if you take the, you know, just the few hundred billion stars, right, that are in our own galaxy, <laughs> those we consider to be one object. Just imagine that's a bunch of, you know, bees orbiting a beehive. And if we, as a, within, from within this galaxy, if we look, well, not even to the nearest galaxy, but if we look, you know, quite far away, then every single object away f in any direction is moving away from us. Okay. Not only that, but we think, well, we think if we could jump to a distant galaxy and now see what's happening, we would get the same perspective. We would see that Again, every object that's very far away from that galaxy is moving away from us. And the farther away they are, the faster they move. But the universe is expanding. That's the main point. It's expanding. Um, and there's a certain rate that we can measure, like how fast is it expanding, right? So we can give a kind of a rate that is expanding, right? And that's, that's, as you can imagine, one of the goals of astronomers. It's one of the goals that I have as a, what's called an observational cosmologist. Don't have a lot of opportunities to, to do that, but, um, but we are able to with this discovery I'll talk about anyway. So it is, is one of the goals. Um, so we think basically, can ex explain that, this kind of is a very strange diagram, but it's, <laughs> did one lose track of the fact the universe is expanding in all directions, um, we have a time we're showing sort of the Big Bang here on the left. I'll just talk loud for a minute, sorry, streamers. And we have an area here, which is dark, before there were stars or galaxies. And then you can start to see the stars and galaxies emerge, and they grow bigger and bigger by forming more stars by merging with other galaxies into the massive objects like our own Milky Way galaxy that we live in today, which is still forming stars within our galaxy and which is the only place we know of that has life. Okay, so let's take a closer look at what we call the dark ages, the time before there were stars and galaxies. Okay, so during these dark ages, Okay, we think that there are the very, very early times, it looks dark. There were no stars and no galaxies. But it wasn't dark, we think, in terms of its activity. This is an incredibly active time in which the universe was building the infrastructure 
into which we would later see stars and galaxies forming, um, almost like you know, building the roads, building the, building the rings in a way in which maybe, maybe the, the jewels of the stars might, might form later. Okay, so at very early times, how did this happen? We think that universe had no stars, no galaxies, but some regions would be slightly denser than other regions. And those regions would have slight, you know, they'd attract more material because there was slightly more gravity there. Gravity would already be acting and those would grow and grow and grow into this kind of picture we think that we show here, which is like a 3D spider web, we call it the cosmic web. I'd rather think of it like a 3D spider web. What you're seeing here in red is not really like red color, but it's meant to indicate where what we call the dark matter is, the stuff that's forming the infrastructure into which the stars and galaxies will later form. Okay, and you can see these sort of bright, dense concentrations, which we call nodes. And those nodes are connected by filaments. So I put these little cars here from a Dr. Seuss episode in order to show that those nodes would be the densest areas. They'd be the places where the baryons, the stuff that stars and galaxies are made of, hydrogen, the hydrogen then rolls along those roads, those filaments, and gets deposited into those nodes of the cosmic web. And it's within those nodes that hundreds of galaxies can eventually form all in the same place. And that would be a galaxy cluster. Those are really the, the metropolises of the universe. The Milky Way does not live in one of those. I suppose it could have. It, it doesn't live in one of those. The Milky Way is one of the two largest galaxies in our local group. But I'm talking about a different size beast. Okay, this is the metropolis. Okay. Here's an example of what a galaxy cluster looks like. One of them, this is one I did my PhD thesis on. It's called Abel 1689. And you know, I can show you there's just a few components of a galaxy cluster. So when I show you another one later on, you'll, you know, you'll be experts. Okay, so I'll have to go off again. I have to point here. I don't have like a pointer. So, okay, so one thing you can see really very well are these blue objects. They look almost like activity scene stars, right? Those are stars. They're stars right in front of us. Those you can almost call the bugs on the windshield, okay? When you sit in a car and take a picture of the beautiful vista, okay, through the car window because it's too hot or too cold and you can't roll the window down, but you get little bugs or bug splotches on the windshield. That's what we're seeing there. Those are stars in our galaxy means they're right, they're right next to us. And what we're taking a picture of is the very distant universe. We're just looking through a few stars that are right in front of our eyes here. Okay, and you can always tell, you can tell by the positioning and size and shape of those nativity scene spikes, which observatory you're looking through <laughs> as well. So if you wanna you know, surprise and impress someone at your next party, you can, you know, and otherwise, every single yellow blob here that you see is a blob has about 10, um, 10 to 100 billion stars in it. Every single yellow blob. This is the metropolis. This is the largest object, single object you think about in the universe. A cluster of galaxies. Each one is a galaxy. Some of them are actually more massive than the Milky Way. They have a different shape, but they're more massive than the Milky Way. And those objects are also not typically what I look at. Those are bugs in a more distant window. Okay. <laughs> so, these objects make up a galaxy cluster. Think of it, 10 billion galaxies here and here. They orbit each other, all these 100 yellow blobs, also like bees orbiting a beehive. And that we call the lens. It's like an eyeglass lens. A hundred billion, a hundred galaxies make up an eyeglass lens. I think we had um, Dr. Cookie telling me about this last night as well, right? So what I'm interested in is the lensing effect. I'm interested in what happens to objects that are behind this galaxy cluster. Mm -hmm. And we'll 
see what happens to those. Okay. Lord, well, I'll show it again one more time. Let's just to, you know, get things started here. Right, so I think, as Dr. Cookie already showed, right, you can have, say, an object up here. You see where it says real, there's a little point. And light comes out of the object that light can pass through a lens. Dr. Cookie showed the sun, which is also a lens, just not as big as a hundred galaxies altogether. But the light comes and it gets bent by that mass. It's just a prediction of Einstein, which turned out to be true. Bent by that mass and viewed by Earth. You see the Earth. And if you're sitting here with a telescope looking through on Earth, what do you see? You see that the light came from that little dot up there, where it says observed. You can't see behind corners. You, can, you wouldn't know it comes behind a corner. That's what you see. Okay. This is the lensing effect that was the <coughs> prediction of Einstein. And of course, you know, if you have a galaxy, you know, with about 100 million stars, 100 billion stars, it should be over more, then, then you will see an even bigger effect. And one of the fascinating effects that you get when you look through galaxy clusters is that you can have a light beam that goes to the right, like you see there, down, and you can have one that goes to the left as well and comes out from the other side. And then what do you see? Then you see a photocopy. Then you literally see two different images of that same object in the background. Now you're going to see one object over here and the other object to the left. Okay? And in any case, as soon as you see also three photocopies of that same object, four, five, six, or more. Okay? So if I, you know, if we suddenly see, you know, six copies of a father's topic, you know, um, <laughs> you know, there's only one real father's topic, but you know, there can be photocopies. These are images like in a fun house almost, right? And I can show this gravitational lensing effect here as well. You can see it also takes the images in the background, distorts them tremendously. You can take a single object that looks kind of like a circle and make it into that ring, Einstein ring. It's just an image. It doesn't mean, well, you know, if it happens to follow subway, we see him as a circle. As well, it doesn't actually mean that he's suffering, right? That's the image of what is happening. He's fine. <laughs> okay, eating his dinner, but then <laughs> it's, the, it's the image that we see, okay? So I'll show one example before we move along. This is that same galaxy cluster I showed before, but now I thought I'd zoom in a little bit and show you one example of one of these photocopies. Okay. So this um, galaxy couple, I call very lovingly galaxy 1 and 12. <laughs> Probably need help with naming, but um, <laughs> and if you look at this, there you go. <laughs> and in the upper right here, you see galaxy one looks kind of like, I don't know, what does it look like, grain of rice, maybe something like that. And number 12, though, is much more fluffy, right? But you can get the idea a little bluer, too, than a little more white. And then if you go counterclockwise, I'm not going to follow over, counterclockwise to here, then you see it looks like those two galaxies kind of rotated a little bit. And you can still see the two, one and 12, and you can make out which is which, right? Yeah. And you could go down here, and you can see that again. Now it looks like they just flipped mm -hmm. positions. And you go down here, we identify this one too. It's a little hard to identify. The colors sort of look all right. Maybe it kind of looks all right. But it's like stretched like tacky mm -hmm. by this lensing effect. <coughs> These two galaxies in the background, they're fine. Okay. These are just photocopies. It's an imperfect photocopy. No engineers at optical lab who are, you know, polishing the glasses. It, it, it's a lens, all right. You can also design a lens that makes you see double, right? But then you take it back. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I'm driving crazy, right? Um, but in this case, right, you don't, you don't see any people who are trying to, you know, polish this lens and get it just right. So it, it comes with all of those defects. But it's those defects that are beautiful. Okay. Um, and I, this is why I call this kind of the waltzing couple. It looks like they're kind of on one of those music machines, you know, those jewelry boxes where the couple kind of turns and dances around. But that's not all. So let's see if we can. We had a question? Yeah. 
The clusters, are they all the same age? Or kind of like they're about the same age. It's a really good question, yeah. They're about the same age. They're actually really old. They're old galaxies, and they're not really forming any new stars. And you can tell they're about the same age because they're about the same color. That's why I'm able to say every little orangey, yellowish galaxy, because the galaxy's color is determined by the stars that it has. Yeah? Are there any black holes in this? Oh, there'd be a lot of black holes, yeah. Pull off that one? Oh, there'd be a lot of black holes, yeah, sure. Yeah. They'd be um, typically in the centers of the galaxies. And we do, we do see evidence of that. Some of them will have jets. They are. Each one is in each blob has at least 10 billion stars in it. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. We're talking about a very big piece of eyeglasses. Yeah, yeah. The kingdom has been revealed. <laughs> there you go, there you go, there you go. How can we be here? How can we be here? Yeah, yeah. It's a, a very good question. Yeah, it's a very good question. And we can continue as well. So, um, what if you have a star that explodes? and we pass it through a lens. Let's start by saying we just have a star that explodes and we just observe it. There it is, there's our eyeball and there's the supernova. But now let's consider the case where we have one of these galaxies that's been, whose image has been photocopied, right? Only one color saw by three images of it. In this case, okay, three <coughs> pink images, I just made the pink of this galaxy. <coughs> this is a false proportion, a red image. Bless you, so I just made it, um, pink like that. And imagine that you have a supernova behind this lens. Remember, the lens is just a lens. It's another windshield. What I'm looking at is what's behind the lens. Imagine you have a star explode. This is a blue supergiant exploding. And we want to observe it over here with our eyeball, but it passes through the lens. Okay, the lens already makes three images of the thing. Whoa, there I get one. <laughs> okay, so one of them, one of them, passes here and gets bent, and we see it in that direction, right? Another one passes through the middle, and another one through the bottom. So let me illustrate that. If you look for the blue dot, it's going to appear up top, down bottom, and in the middle. So, yeah. so this is the lens is a galaxy? What is the lens? The lens is the cluster. So the lens is the cluster. The galaxy comes. I'm not showing all of it here. Oh, I see. I'm just showing the effect. Oh, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Thank the effect, you. which is to take something in the background and render it three different times. Those okay. are just three different photocopies of that exploding star. Okay, and it's the same cluster of the previous it's three? The, it's exactly the same cluster? No, it's not. It's a it's, cluster. Oh, this is a, a galactic cluster? Yeah, a that. cluster. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not true you've seen when you've seen them all, but that kind of concept. <laughs> like, good enough for this slide, okay. yeah. Okay. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Exactly. But did you notice when we saw how the supernova came, we not only get the, the photocopies, of that background object, but we see them at three different times. You see how we saw a dot, and then later a dot here, and later a dot there. So now it's like we get three different photocopies of Father Shopping, and we get him at 10 years old, we get him at 35 years old, and then we get him today. Okay? 36. 36, yeah. Yeah, 36. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right, yeah. So, um, so we see these things at different times. The way to think of it is that you can see that the paths might have different lengths. So you can think of them as hiking paths. Imagine you walk at the same pace. You try to just walk at the same pace. But if you go three different distances, you'll take different amounts of time then to get there. Right? So you can take three of you starting at the same place. And you want to walk all the way to the observatory here. And you're going to walk at the same pace, which is the speed of light. Oh, <laughs> we'll walk um, the same pace, which is the speed of light, and you'll arrive at different times. That's really why you're arriving at different times, okay? And, well, not only that, but it takes so long to hike all that way, even for light, which travels really fast, okay? Even for light, to travel all that way, it takes so long that the universe, remember, is expanding, has expanded a lot in that time frame. So it turns out, maybe the punchline here right away, if you can take a stopwatch 
and measure the time difference in the arrival of this supernova explosion, each image, okay? And if you have a prescription for the eyeglasses, you need that too. It's really just a prescription for the eyeglasses that we're doing here. Then you can measure that expansion rate of the universe directly. Directly, yeah. Okay, what else do I have here? I have something in the upper left, um, which is a, that's just a light curve it's called. It's showing what an explosion does. It's called a supernova. Right, you get an explosion. It's an explosion of a whole star. You get an explosion, and then it dies down after a while, just like another. It's a quite a big explosion. We're seeing this one um, billions of years ago, and we can actually observe it from our planet, which is exciting, or just outside the planet, you know, just outside the orbit of the moon, but we see it. But if it's a certain type of supernova, which we call type 1A, it's the type that some of you may know was used also to discover that the universe is accelerating in addition to the expansion, but that's okay. The standard candle designation, type 1A, means that for this particular supernova, we would know its intrinsic brightness. That means we would know, it's like a light bulb, big light bulb, and we would know what the wattage is. Just read it off the side of the light bulb. Yeah. You don't want to buy the light bulb with the wrong wattage. You don't want something, you know, 300 watt thing, and we all would be piercingly bright in this room, right? So uh. you want to buy the light bulbs for this room, for anywhere else with the right wattage. With this supernova, you know what the wattage is. Very powerful. Right. So if you have a supernova like that, then the explosion is a bit different. It rises up and falls down, but it has also a secondary peak. It has to do with quite detailed astrophysical reasons, but it peaks, peaks again, and then goes back down. <coughs> so that would be a telltale sign that we would have the standard candle, which is really, I guess you'd say, the holy grail of this type of work. Okay, I think we have all the bits and pieces. I've given you quite a lot of information, by the way, so don't worry about it. We'll review as we go. And the last, did I get there? I think that's it, right? Oh, yeah, I'll get there. Okay, so the last one, don't worry too much about this plot, but I just wanted to show it to say that what we're after is to measure the expansion rate of the universe. It's called h naught. It's been sought after for um, 100 years. And it's been debated for 100 years. We started to at first think it must be two very different numbers for somewhat f different philosophical reasons. Decided so that was a bad idea. We should just measure it. <laughs> okay. And then once we measure it, then it got kind of boring. We thought we had the right answer. And in the past 10 years, a new problem emerged, which is now that you can measure this expansion rate at very early times in the universe's history, and you get values that are pretty low. You don't need to worry about the numbers, but just you can see they're on the left here. And when we measure the value closer to us, we get values that seem with some differences here and there, they might be telling us that we get different values in the early universe and the more at later times too. And that would tell us that there's some, there's some very big piece of our understanding of the universe that we're missing. So that's kind of the background and motivation for doing this kind of thing. So I just drew an ellipse there to show off my keynote skills. <laughs> I just say that. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's room, there's room for more. We could use more answers and we could try to learn how to get, make them with higher precision so we can try to understand this really fundamental problem about our universe. That's enough intro there. Um, so I'd like to move on to talk about the Pearls Clusters program. I joined the James Webb Space Telescope science team and instrument team in 2005, quite a long time ago. And then I initiated um, along with a branch, along with the PI, uh, Roger Windhorst at ASU, what's called the JWST Pearls program. This is more my baby that I started like in 2013. Okay, and our job was to select the very best galaxy clusters to look at with the James Webb Space Telescope in order to advance the type of science that I've been discussing. Okay, to try to, um, to, try to get more and more accurate uh, prescriptions of these lenses, 
which are um, awesome and strange and powerful, but also tricky to get at, and to try to make discoveries of transients. These are of objects that appear and then disappear. Okay. Bless you. Yeah. Oh, this one up at the top. Yeah. <laughs> You're very perceptive. Yeah. So I don't have time to talk about all seven of them. There are stories um, that I can go on forever about, um, but the only one from this program I can talk about because we don't have enough time to talk about them all is the one in the upper right. So <laughs> very good eyes, yeah. I call that one G165. Again, I probably need help with, with, with naming schemes. But let me move on and say, so I started this project, Pearls Clusters, in 2013. And what would it be? Nine years later, we have done a lot of due diligence. We found what we thought were the very best galaxy clusters to look at with James Webb Space Telescope. We tried to adopt some of the best studied clusters from around the world to make use of um, the knowledge, um, the, the body of knowledge in our field. And we also decided to take some risks because um, it's only by taking a risk that you can actually kind of, I would call it, shake the pear tree and see if we can learn something new about these lenses and so on. Um, so a few of us got to put forward ideas, and I did get this cluster that I had discovered, the G165 cluster, onto this list um, by trying to search for the cluster that would have, not in it, not in the eyeglasses, but behind it, the highest integrated value of the star formation going on behind it. So I was hoping that we might be able to discover a transient that way. We still don't know for sure, but we do our best. So then we have, by this point, 30 people in a very tight team who know what they're doing from all around the world, ready for the James Webb Space Telescope data to arrive. We knew our first data would be coming in August of 2022. So we were ready by July of 2022. We were all in place. I really, it's been so much work to get there. I would say daily meetings already, daily worldwide group meetings for quite a long time. We had assembled our team. We had trained a lot of people. I, in particular, um, for some reason, enjoy training very young people. People just in undergraduates were getting access to this great, great data sets. Um, and it takes a lot of time to train people so that they can know what they're looking at. And they were in place. I like to think it's like a theater. And we have the stage set up. And we have the orchestra pit built with the theater built. Built that too, the orchestra pit. People are sitting down. They're ready with their music. And we're just waiting and waiting and waiting. And I, you could feel the excitement. And I just can't wait until the curtain opens. And then we'll jump, you know. And, and I just I kind of thought, you know, um, you know, after all this time, bless you, maybe, maybe a 20-year-old can feel that excitement. But could I? Because I'd been doing this for a while by now. And I would soon very much learn, learn the answer. But then, we didn't have to wait till August. So it turns out, on July 12th, we were told that there would be public data release to be the very first data. Not our data from this Pearls program, but just some public data. So um, the hope would be that astronomers would bite and maybe do something with it and show that this was a good telescope or so on. So we thought, OK, it's not our program, but of course, we're going to take a look. But before that happened, the Friday before, we get some other news that President Biden wants to be the one who presents this data, this galaxy field. OK, fine, OK. And that would happen, I think that was going to happen on a Tuesday night before we'd actually get the data. So of course, we'll take a look. Not really what I do, I would think, because what does a galaxy field mean? I don't know. I mean, there's 40,000 degrees of sky, a whole universe out there. Um, why would they choose, you know, anything that I do? I don't know. So we were all sitting there waiting. There it is right there. We used, I think it was 5 o'clock press conference where I was. I was in California at the time. And we waited for an hour and a half for this press conference to start. So we're all nodding our heads like a metronome to the elevator music. <laughs> Astronomers around the world <laughs> waiting for this result to come out. When it comes out, it's so far away. It's just like that look. I mean, you could see President Biden. You can see um, cameras. You could see desks. And then you can see a, a big stage or something. And then way in the back is this little tiny image of this galaxy cluster. 
um, of this galaxy field. And so we're all doing what I did too, which is take a little screenshot, you know, on your computer and, and zoom it up and see what you've got. And oh my gosh, did that not jump off the screen? That's a galaxy cluster. And those are gravitationally lensed and distorted, you know, photocopies of objects right on the screen there. That's what I do. That's what I've been trained to do. That's what I've trained this whole world, team worldwide to do. I was, I was, I was in complete amazement. I fell out of my chair. I called, I called my graduate student. I said, okay, um, did you see this, Massimo? And he said, yes, I saw it. What do we do? And I said, we start looking at it now, you know. And then I, I talked to my husband and I said, can I have a few students come over to the house? And he's like, bring them over, you know. So they all came over and we did just that. We only had a little, like, electronic device and a little JPEG image, which is all fuzzy. We started writing on it. And then we did what we could to try to get some results out. And then we said, okay, let's meet tomorrow. We sent them off to our friends who are in different time zones around the world. And lo and behold, we came back the next day. And without even committing or telling anyone what the story was, because we were really going to wait till August till our data came in, we were all trained to look at this kind of thing. So without even telling them, they just sent back you know, confirmation and some changes and some additions to what we had done that, that, that last night. And then we all realized, well, um, so my graduate student, you know, maybe, maybe we should write this up. Like we're just, like it, it's as if light, big fireworks went off in every astronomer's head around the world suddenly when we got this data in. Let me just show you, this is what the data looked like before the James Webb Space Telescope. We obviously went and looked up any archival images after the fact. And there's some numbers on them, but don't worry about that. And this is what the James Webb image looked like of the same field. Okay, this is another galaxy cluster, but you can tell it's taken by a different telescope because you can look at those diffraction spikes on the stars. Right? Right? Didn't the other one have, it looked like it had mainly just four spikes, right? When do these have? Six. Yeah, when you see those six bright blue spikes, that's from the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, now, you, now you can, there you go, okay. So there's still stars in the way. These stars are still, you know, the smudges on the windshield or on your glasses, if you didn't watch them that morning. Um, and then now we have the blobs are these white ones. The whitish ones all around are, are the galaxies in the eyeglasses in the lens. Now they're white instead of yellow-orange. And all these things that look like kind of distorted banana-shaped objects, those are objects in the background. They may have been like circles and they got stretched by this eyeglass, by the prescription of the eyeglass into these shapes. Yeah, and I zoom in here on one of these things just because here's one of these really distant galaxies. We notice that we have such great sensitivity. We not only saw the new galaxy forming, but you see all these little dots around it? It reminded me like of sort of those ones where you have the kind of tree and the little toothpicks and little <laughs> kind of fruit or something on each toothpick, you know? Um, but each one of those really is um, what we think is a newly forming globular cluster. Globular clusters are great concentrations of up to a million stars that we see surrounding the Milky Way, dozens of them surrounding the Milky Way that we think should be a part of every galaxy, but we've never seen them really forming before, and they just come before our eyes. We also detected um, what we think is a supergiant star that appeared, I don't get to show it, there's too much to show in this one talk, um, at great distances. What is the depth of vision that we're seeing? Oh, oh, <laughs> um, well quite a lot, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, so, the stars are right next to us. They're in our own galaxy, the stars. So they're right next to us, okay? These white blobs are in the lens. So they're in like a pair of eyeglasses, you know, somewhere in between. And we're looking through the eyeglasses. But the eyeglasses aren't polished, which is why all these images look distorted and so on. Nobody's, there's no optical shock out there, okay? And then all of these super colorful beautiful colors of objects are way in the distance. Far away. Far away. And we, we look through the lens to see them way at the distance. Yeah. Can I point something? Yeah. Sorry. Please, yeah, that's something. Will, will this galaxy 
Oh, so it's not the same one, but that's the game you want to play. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, deter you because that is the game that we started playing. Oh yeah, that's the game we started playing right away, definitely. If you saw the slide beforehand where I kind of chose this kind of figure eight thing and I said, don't worry about it, that's what we thought the original prescription of the lens should be, which we suddenly made based on archival data, it's like old data from some other telescope. But then we started looking at these, and we started saying, which ones are doubles? Like, yeah. this one is a double with that one. So those are photocopies, yeah. Oh, okay. this, this one here, I don't remember. We had a terrible name, like the bacon or something for this <laughs> one up there. <laughs> but then our, our French colleagues called it the beret. Just much, <laughs> much more elegant name, you know. So um, I prefer the beret now as a name for that. But it turns out that we, we cannot find another image of the beret. Okay. Even though the beret, obviously a galaxy doesn't look like that, doesn't look like a, a hat. Oh, but <laughs> so, you, so you know that it's really distorted and there might be a photocopy of it, but we, we can't find one. So we have the, the lens model, which is the prescription of the eyeglass lens. We call it the lens model. Mm -hmm. That is set up such that it allows for there to be a double image here. You'll see double here, but you won't see double up there. You can see how we put together the different, we call it, lensing evidence. How many galaxies are shown in that? Oh, well, th this is a somewhat smaller cluster. This is, right at, this is a very small cluster. I'm going follow up that way now. Um, I, guess, I guess all of these are galaxies, too. So, I mean, there would be something like, I think, I think we put 30 or 40 in our, in our lens model of the most prominent ones. So, yeah. So once you figure out the prescription, can you like take the image and process it and make it look like what you think it? You can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can do that. It's still pretty hard to do. We do it on very small scales. So just to see, for example, like what the beret looked like, or something like that, how it gets mapped back onto what it would actually look like. Yeah, without those glasses in the way. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So it turns out that I guess three and a half days. Let me say this again for those of you who might do science. Three and a half days after this data came out, which is the very first data any astronomer sees coming out of the James Webb Space Telescope at all, the very first data, my graduate student submitted a paper to Referee Journal. <laughs> so, um, but as a senior colleague noted that and wrote me an email saying, congratulations for writing the web wave. So, <laughs> you know, a, a web wave there, you know. I couldn't believe it either because that paper then my graduate student will always have bragging rights for the rest of his life now. Um, but his was second, the second paper submitted to a journal. The first one was submitted 12 seconds earlier. Uh -oh. <laughs> but this was the first one from the United States. And it was sent to a different journal, which was a US journal. And I said, oh, don't worry, you know, you do want to get some sleep because we, of course, didn't sleep for three and a half days, essentially. I mean, barely sleeping to try to keep going, 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 because it was so exciting. And then we said, well, you can get some sleep now because, of course, you know, editors of journals don't pay attention to things on the weekend, you know. Unlike us, they have a weekend. They'll come back on Monday. But no, this was a Saturday morning when he submitted the paper, and 30 minutes after he submitted the paper, editor wrote back and said, it's gone to referee. So they were waiting for someone to submit a paper. And they had referees lined up in different fields to see who they could send it to. So that was um, quite exciting. I mean, often I have to write three and four times to an editor just to see what the status of a paper might be. So this was um, very exciting even for the you know, people at the journal. But that, I would say, was a dress rehearsal. So the main event comes next. A few more adventures along the way, you know. We'll take a few more hours to talk about it all, so we'll skip that for now. <laughs> so then we come to the one cluster G165, which is the one that I was lucky enough to select, and we get everybody in my group who's in Tucson in the room and pulling in chairs and they're standing in the hallway, and we get people all over the world online who are on my team. And I literally obviously got the image, you know. 
an hour beforehand or something, but I deliberately, I'm not gonna look at it, we'll look at it all together as a team, we're a team, <laughs> show it, put it, all, put it up on there, and I start playing games like, you know, zooming in and out, pretending like I'm flying around the cluster. What did we get, what did we see? And right away, I mean, literally right away, just like it shows on a Nova documentary or something, where, where the journalist says, pretend you discovered something, you know? <laughs> and you're supposed to point and say, oh, I just discovered something. You know, this is not really how science works. <laughs> but this is exactly how science worked in this case. <laughs> Pointed to the screen and said, what are those three dots there, there, and there that weren't there before? He said, well, don't worry about it. So this is you know, some of the first data come from the James Webb Space Telescope, highest sensitivity um, telescope we've ever had. It's working it in colors of the infrared um, that we've never had good data on before. So it's just, you know, it's just seeing faint things. It and then we kind of thought, well, how, how faint are they then? You know? And it turns out they're so bright you could see them from a small telescope, for those who know 24th magnitude, which is extremely bright. And we, we did know that the, the redshift was, I mean, the, the distance it was, was it something like, you know, 80% um, the look back time of the whole universe. So this is a very, very, very bright thing. And then we realized, well, what if we could put it on that light curve? Remember that light curve I showed where the supernova explodes and it goes down and it goes up one more time and goes down? Well, normally you'd have one point because you have one supernova and you couldn't tell anything from that one point. <laughs> but in this case, we have three points for that light curve. One, two, and three. And remember I said you get, they arrive at different times. It's like we get photocopies of Father Self, but at different ages in his life, different times. So we can map them now at three different places on the light curve. And lo and behold, wow, it looked like a supernova to a 95% probability. Yeah, that's what we're going to get to. Yeah, that's what we're going to get to. Yeah. Here's another picture of the same thing, and here I made a little cartoon image of it. I can show you as well something interesting. Maybe I'll show you. You could look at either one as we go through this. A kind of just made a cartoon version of that galaxy being yellow with the little supernova dot being the blue one. And then you can see when you go from image 2C to 2B how that flips. The dot seems to go from the right to the left. And then it flips again when you go up to that top image. So to see the placement of it relative to the center of that dot. And right when we saw that, we knew that these were three images of the same object. Because each time you get a new image for this cluster, you expect what's called a parity flip of anything you see. So if it'd be a picture of Alvesape like this, then it would suddenly be a parity flip where his left arm would be here and his right arm would be there. Okay? And then it flip back to the other way. They're parity flips. Okay? So we knew that we had a lensed object as well. So what comes next? Well, this would be the most distant exploding star ever found that's lensed. And we suspect that it's a standard candle, something of known wattage which is very powerful in science when you know the intrinsic brightness. But what's it gonna do? It's gonna fade. So what can we do? Well, we decided we would appeal to the director for what's called disruptive, disruptive <laughs> director's discretionary time. <laughs> but it, it's, it's a really formal document. It has to be written up correctly. It's going, to, it's going to be dual anonymous. It's going to be sent to a committee of 10 people from around the world and then we'll see what they say back. And I felt like for <coughs> up this point to my career, like, just don't want to lose, you know. So it involved an awful lot of typing, followed by sleeping at the keyboard. And we literally, yeah. Who owns the James Webb? I mean, who controls, makes it's, that decision? Now, well, it's, it's NASA. It's run, it's run by NASA and some, some organization called the Space Telescope Science Institute then makes those decisions. Well, we'd be requesting disruptive time, which means we're going to ask it to stop doing anything else and do our program and go back. It's a very, very specific type of ask. 
and we just, I just decided to have a six day, <laughs> essentially six day and six night kind of group meeting over a shared document scheme with all my colleagues worldwide. And we just have a working to-do list and go one by one by one. And anyone who would show up, I'd give them a job. Um, I work a lot with, like I said, with very young people, undergraduates. And even if they weren't trained, well, they can read a technical manual. I, it's a brand new observatory. I needed to find numbers from the technical manuals. Sure, you know, they could do a word search and show stuff. So we had people working at every level from senior faculty to postdocs and graduate students and undergraduate students. But only this telescope can see for sure that second light peak and can help us get the data we need to measure this expansion rate. And I can show you, um, we worked with a lot of people. Here are some of the young people. I mean, literally 10 undergraduates were involved at various levels with helping this come by. Very exciting time. They helped give me energy through this. Oh, I should go back. And then we sent this in, I think it was um, for six days, sent it in on Thursday night. And then we heard right away that it had gone to committee. And then by Monday morning, the news arrived and by email. And I don't know what to do. So I went to my son and I asked him if he could read the email because I was too nervous to read it. <laughs> so he's like, okay, this one, uh, yeah, it should say like space telescope. You see, yeah, okay, I can read that one. And he reads it and says that, congratulations on the given the time. And I just started screaming. I never really thought before. <laughs> Completely, you know. and, then, and then he said, um, so, um, and I said, wait, you're not making this up. <laughs> And he said, how, how could I possibly know how to make this up? You know, he said, <laughs> so then we thought, well, maybe we'll celebrate. But no, then in that same email, it said, and by the way, you have 48 hours now to make, build the instrumental setup <laughs> for this thing, which is the real, real detailed programming commands that actually get sent to the observatory. Thank you. Um, because now you have to suddenly become an expert in all those things or make friends with people who are. So that, that was what I tried to do. So instantly reached out, of course, to those people at Space Telescope who helped build these instruments. I said, you know, let's, let's meet. And we did, and I think those administrators won some kind of internal service award for their diligence in helping to organize this particular disruptive observations. And if you'd like to see, oh yeah, there we go, okay. There it is. So this is our final observation. Summed up, we got multiple epochs, so we could follow this light curve. As you'll see in a minute, the data follow the light curve of a type 1a perfectly. Um, you see, this is a galaxy cluster here called G165. I've kind of I showed you the supernova earlier, so you can't see it so well from your seats, but you can see it's labeled here, supernova A, B, and C. Three images of the same supernova. This is at a very distant, for those who know redshifts, redshift 1.8, which is extremely high for a type 1a. We see, oh, you know, pretty interesting. I deliberately avoided the stars. So you don't see a lot of stars here. Because um, remember, there's smudges on the windshield. Um, there are a couple. But I'm trying to, oh yeah, like here's one here. You know, they're, they're very faint though. And then the galaxies, you can see those are the huge white blobs. Right there, 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 there. You can see those. And then the red objects are the things way in the distance, right, that, whose images are photocopied. Okay. So are the galaxies the things that are causing the one minute effect? That's a really good question. Um, the galaxies are part of it, yes. But those galaxies are sitting, as I almost like to say, almost like the diamond on the ring, in a node of this cosmic web, this 3D web, that's mostly dark matter. So these galaxy clusters are dominated by the matter we don't see. We do see these bright galaxies. Another alternative way to think of it is they're like the tips of the iceberg. Because most of the iceberg is under the water and you see the tip. These things are massive, containing tens and hundreds of billions of stars each. And that's just the tip of the iceberg each time. Now, something that might strike you is, remember in that earlier image that I showed, the first image to come off of Space Telescope, that it looks um, like every color of the rainbow, all these background galaxies, right? But these are all pretty close to one color, kind of orangey-red. Very interesting. But it, 
So it turns out we learned by doing these observations that we got spectroscopy with JWST. It was, it was an absolute dream. When we did it, we realized that it's because all of these objects are basically at the same distance, making a different lens, a different pair of glasses behind it. They're not all at different distances. They're all at the same distance behind it. So there's a baby galaxy cluster forming in the background, which is being lensed by the foreground one, two pairs of eyeglasses <laughs> along the way. <laughs> and this supernova is part of it, a part of that. The baby one. Yes, a part of the baby one, yeah. OK, so in the end, we were able to get three images with JWST. I just got a fourth one approved last month, so we can add to that because we also need an image of this thing without the supernova in it. We've been so lucky that we have these beautiful images, but it always has a supernova in it. We need one without it so we can have a good template image to see what it, in great detail what it looks like without the supernova. But based on those nine points, um, each one color-coded by blue, green, and red to suit whether it's image A, B, or C. And you can see that they fit this, um, this style of supernova just right and no other type of supernova and no other type of object. So based on finding the peak, measuring where the peak of brightness would be in each one, we can take the stopwatch and we find <coughs> that it's about a 50-day difference between the three. Okay, so for the stopwatch, it wouldn't really be age 10, age 35. <laughs> It'd be like 100 days ago, 50 days ago, you know, that type of thing. And by measuring that time delay, and then by also getting the prescription of the glasses, which I kind of show in pink here, outline in pink here. You can see it as contours. You can see they're almost like two sides. We think this galaxy cluster is crashing into each other, like two big sumo wrestlers going at it on the wrestling mat. Yeah. Um, and you can I put it also in 1D here. But if we have the prescription of the eyeglasses and the stopwatch, and we know how far away these things are, which I confirmed with the JWST data, then we could measure the value for each knot, which we did, which we obtained from this, from, the, from this thing. And what we get is we get a value 75.4 plus 8.1 minus 5.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. That's the first time I've ever said that out loud in public, because this, <laughs> every other time, every other time, it might not mean anything to you, but I just finally said it, because it was embargoed. And people would ask, and they'd be frustrated. I I can't say it, you know. So, <laughs> so we, we did it. We did it. Um, okay. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> but before it, gets, before it goes too, too far here, um, it doesn't solve this problem of what H0 is in and of itself. But it offers a route to do it. So um, we, think if, if we, we think we can discover a few more using kind of similar technique. And if we can put about five of these together, we can quite probably make an impact on what the value is for the expansion rate. That's, that's where we are. How many planets? Planets? Well, that's a really good question. Very likely, yeah. We, we, we think that a natural end state of star formation probably does include planets in many cases. Yeah. Yeah. You what? just mentioned about the expansion rate. At what time of the 3.8 billion years are we looking at here? Of the 13.8 billion years? Yeah. What, you mean at what point in the 13.8 yeah. billion year oh, history so yeah, of the universe? <laughs> yeah, it'd be about, about 80% of the look back time, something like that, 75, 80%. Yeah. yeah, half the look back time is what we call redshift one. That's just what we call it. That's about seven billion years. And it's not linear. Okay, so summary slide. Um, the JWST Pearl Science and JWST in general has just been a free for all. I can only describe it in this way, like a kid knocking the pinata over, and then all of us just <laughs> jump into the middle, you know, forget that we're adults, and just jump right into the middle, um, or what happens if you jump and your knees might hurt or something by the time you <laughs> just jump and grab the candy and start, start dealing with it. So we were, we have been, felt extremely privileged to see these 
um, amazing images of the universe. Um, and to learn about these maps of the dark matter, which is the prescription of the glasses to make these detections of some very early examples of stars exploding, which teach us about some greater properties of the whole universe. Okay, and um, what is the name of what? Sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what we call the the value for the expansion rate of the universe. We call it the Hubble constant, or Hubble's constant H naught. That's just that's the variable name, and I slip it in there even for public talks. Is, that's isn't it. it the Hubble La Lamatra? It's the Hubble Lamatra, thank you. That's exactly yes. right, yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. Yeah, and that's, that, that's my whole talk. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. I just want to point out you're mentioning the Roman telescope. Yes. It's nothing to do with Roman. <laughs> uh, it's named for uh, Nancy Roman. That's right. Who was one of the pioneers. And we've all got the, the, that coin from Annie John Cannon. We've got the Roman telescope. Well, we had the Vera Rubin telescope. Vera Rubin was uh, at Georgetown University. And it just happens that unlike a lot of other fields of science, women have been involved in astronomy going back 150 years. I've got a, a short story. One of the early women involved in astronomy was Mariah Mitchell. And she actually observed the eclipse in 1870 in Denver. Uh, she had a chance to visit Father Angelo Secchi, who I talked about, in Rome, remember that Father Secchi's telescope was on the roof of the church. To get to the telescope, you had to go behind the altar. Oh. Mm. He wanted to invite her to take use observations, and somebody said, you can't have a woman going on the altar. And he said, what if she brings flowers to put on the altar? <laughs> That's the solution they came up with. <laughs> Yeah, go get that story. You need to wait to that. Um, so, at the risk of sounding stupid, how if we're if if the image of the James Webb Telescope is billions of years in the past and we're looking at it, does how long does it take for something to kind of fade away from it or disappear from an image? Does the are, are astronomers keeping track of say how long the the supernova it takes to kind of burn out, so to speak? Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, so first of all, because it's so far away, we get to see the explosion time sort of slows down for us. We get kind of a slow-mo mm. version of it just because it's so far away. And that helped as well, so we didn't have to write this follow-up proposal in six minutes, but we have six days. <laughs> um, so there's that, but it's also, we're just also really lucky because you can plan all you want, but there's great luck here that we did get this standard canvas, we call it, this object of known wattage. That object's been studied extremely well, and we know exactly how it dies down over time. So we know we have the expectation down quite well, and we were just simply confirming that rather than learning anything new about that part, if that helps a little bit. Yeah, okay, and right at the front first. Oh yeah, I was going to ask, uh, so according to this new understanding, would you think that the rate of expansion is accelerating or not? Or oh, well, we, well, that's another good point. I mean, so based on this type of work, we can only measure just the rate of expansion. We don't measure if it's accelerating or decelerating. Okay. So this is a separate measurement. but. In case you may have heard of this, or maybe recall it from a long time ago, it's that particular type of supernova, the standard candle, the type 1A, that is used to measure the, ex the ex cosmic acceleration. So it is possible, I mean, there was a, a, there's a Nobel Prize winner, Adam Reese, on our team, who was writing me every week. He was very excited about it. 
and you know he was you know concerned about our prescription to make sure our eyeglass prescription is really well written right because you want to be able to trust those values and of course as you might imagine um, it's good that this was a standard candle so if you have something of known wattage and it's going its properties will get altered then if you know the lens and you know the known wattage then you can know what the you know what the distortions will be exactly and you can trace that back so yeah um, we don't learn about the cosmic acceleration yet but that would be the next step I mean a little while from now that is what I did with the rubber universe yeah yeah um, so we know that the universe is accelerating <coughs> in its expansion but this new result doesn't pertain to the accelerating part that's all mm -hmm. not yet but it does use the same type of supernova so it might get there yeah, yeah so it might just, does it change that or not or we don't know um, it can but we don't know yet the errors would still be too high until we can get a better prescription yeah, you had a question? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I think my question might be not to be connected with what you are saying because I came in a little bit late. But, uh, and I don't know your faith tradition, but uh, what you just said and what I picked right now, do you find this experience kind of have a connection with your faith? Oh, absolutely, yeah, maybe yeah. Maybe the, the story of creation and all that. Yeah, yeah. Can enhance your faith or maybe lose your faith? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'm Jewish, um, and, and, and yes, I, as I kind of mentioned yesterday as well during my talk, um, this, these images have, have kind of put me in complete awe of, of creation, of God's creation. Um, and I didn't even expect it would happen. Um, I, I thought, of all people, I would know what to expect because I've worked on it for years and years and years, and we know how much better the images will be. We know by how much. We know what will change, more or less. And I did not expect to be just, just completely entranced by the whole thing. I did not know that there could be exactly so much beauty um, in the universe just like that. And as Dr. Graney pointed out earlier, this is not a type of beauty that we're trained to look at, it's not a flower or something else. It's something completely new. And yet, I've just found myself um, just utterly blown away by it. So I'm, I'm in awe of God based on this, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I call Maggie since 2019, once or twice a year. I call him three times a year. <laughs> You're my help out for this weekend, Father. <laughs> <laughs> He covered my masses at my parish. Oh. Let's get it. Maybe one more question. We, we do have a time on the dinner, but we are supposed to have um, an evening prayer in, uh, at 6.15, and then dinner at 6.30, and you're, you're going to love it. <laughs> there was a question. There was a question over here. Yeah. You sure? Okay. Yes. Yeah. What does pearl stand for? Okay. Um, <laughs> the sufferer, the whiplash, it goes all the way back to the beginning. The prime extragalactic areas for reionization and lensing science. It's a mouthful. So it's as what happens normally these days. We choose. A name that we like, ideally monosyllabic, so it's easy, and then we try to squeeze square pieces into round holes or the other way around. Yeah, so that's one of those examples, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, good.